right. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohammed Khalil. I'm the director of the Michigan State uh, University Muslim Studies Program, as well as professor of religious studies. Uh, I'm truly delighted to welcome you all to our second annual Malcolm and Ann Kerr Muslim Studies Community Lecture, featuring our distinguished speaker, Professor Judith Tucker. In addition to the uh, Muslim Studies Program, this event is brought to you by the African Studies Center, Asian Studies Center, Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, Center for Gender and Global Context, Department of History, Department of Religious Studies, Global Studies in the Arts and Humanities, and James Madison College. And all of these units are at Michigan State University, MSU. And we collectively acknowledge that MSU occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi peoples. We affirm and support indig indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold MSU more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. Now, it's a pleasure to be with you all. I, I'm here uh, virtually on Zoom because of a health related matter. Uh, I wanna thank Professor Amina Everett for um, uh, you know, taking over and, and doing a great job. Um, now, this, uh, this is our second uh, Malcolm and Ann Kerr lecture. The first ever uh, Malcolm and Ann Kerr lecture last year was made possible thanks to a generous gift by Dr. Iltifat Hamzavi. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Hamzavi for helping us establish this annual lecture. If others would like to support future iterations of this lecture, please let us know. I also want to take this opportunity to thank uh, an incredible individual uh, who has de deals with all the logistical issues, and that's Mary Ferdowsi. Um, and uh, there's a lot I could say about Mary, but um, I'll, uh, Mary asked me not to say too much, so I'll keep it simple. And I want to thank again Professor Amina Everett for escorting our guest speaker and, and uh, managing the event uh, on site. And of course, needless to say, None of this would be possible without the support and endorsement of the Kerr family. And we're actually joined this evening by Professor John Kerr, and I believe we have Professor Ann Kerr with us online. Now, I'd like to say a word about why we chose to establish this lecture. The late Professor Malcolm Kerr was an, influ was an influential scholar of the Middle East, who eventually became president of the American University of Beirut. Incidentally, as some of you well know, the Middle East Studies Association of North America offers a dissertation award in his name. Many of us have applied for that award and, well, didn't receive it, but that's okay. <laughs> Professor, <laughs> Professor Ann Kerr, who gave last year's inaugural lecture, is also a distinguished scholar who has studied and taught in the Middle East and has authored two books on the region, Come With Me from Lebanon and Painting the Middle East. Malcolm and Ann Kerr represent scholars with a genuine desire to understand that which is often misunderstood. The Kerr family experienced profound tragedy and assassination in 1984. Yet this tragedy did not diminish their spirit of open-mindedness and their calls for understanding. Many of you may recall Ann and Malcolm's son, the accomplished uh, NBA coach Steve Kerr, speaking out very vocally against the so-called Muslim travel ban. This particular lecture series seeks to highlight the Kerr spirit of open-mindedness and understanding in contexts that may seem complicated and challenging. The fact of the matter is that we're never going to agree on everything, but the least we can do is be sincere in our quest for knowledge and understanding, and excuse the cliche, to recognize our shared humanity. Malcolm and Ann Kerr have four children. I already mentioned Steve Kerr, we're fortunate to have here at MSU another all-star son with us, that's Professor John Kerr. And at this time, I'd like to invite Professor Kerr to say a few words about his parents. Professor John Kerr is a professor in the Department of Community Sustainability and a leader in the field. He received his PhD in Applied Economics from Stanford University, and before joining the faculty at MSU in 1999, he worked at the International Crops Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics in Hyderabad, India, and the International Food Policy Research Institute in Washington, DC. Please join me in welcoming Professor John Kerr as he shares some thoughts about this annual Kerr lecture. Thanks a lot. Uh, Mohammed. can you hear me over Zoom? I can, yes. Great, good, yeah, I uh, chuckled there when 
when uh, Muhammad mentioned the All Star Sun. <laughs> I, it, I, I, was, I wasn't sure I was going to transition because I was going to have to get rid of my first paragraph because mm -hmm. Muhammad had said everything that I went, might have liked to start with. But then I, I laughed because my mom I, is possibly on, uh, on this call. But um, when someone asks her to, you know, about her son, Steve, she's like, oh, you really need to know about my other kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm like, thank you, Muhammad. <laughs> So, but I imagine some of you might be wondering uh, or might have been wondering before Muhammad's uh, gracious introduction, who, who my parents, Anne and Malcolm Kerr are and uh, why this annual community lecture is named after them. And uh, sorry, um, in the last few weeks, a couple of, you know, I was trying to think of some, some examples to kind of illustrate. And, re and really the examples I came up, up with illustrate the things that Muhammad was just saying just now. So I was really happy about that. Um, in the last, few weeks, a couple of examples came to my mind to help illustrate this, why we might want to commemorate them with a, a lecture of this, of this kind, of an event of this kind. And um, one was correspondence from a newly minted PhD and assistant professor of history at uh, Case Western Reserve in University in Cleveland named my son Haidar. And she was looking for background information on my dad's academic thinking. And so she wrote to me, she wrote the following. She said, while I was reading the canon of Middle Eastern slash Islamic history in grad school, there was a significant difference in tone and worldview progressively over the last half of the 20th century. And your family's work seemed to lead the charge. She told me that previous literature didn't seem to show appreciation or respect for uh, local cultures and never seemed to really understand the context Fully, but that my dad's work wasn't like that. So I was, you know, I thought, really, that's really cool. I was, I was thrilled. And today, you know, we're in this era of calls to um, give more voice to local people, to um, tell their own stories, and to minimize the role of outsiders in representing cultures that are not their own. And so I was wondering, kind of, and worried a bit, what would be current perspectives on my dad's work. And so it was really gratifying to hear what my son had to say. Um, another thing that caught my mind the other day was I found a YouTube video of my brother Steve giving a commencement address at the University of Arizona. And he gave the usual exhortations to students to do good things, and he told a couple stories. And one of the stories was of, of my brother Andrew and Steve and my parents uh, when they were in uh, school in, in Cairo. I was in college by then. They took a trip to, uh, to Israel and the, and the West Bank. Uh, in the early days when it first became possible to take a road trip from Cairo to Jerusalem. And he said that the first night they stayed with Palestinian friends, and then the second night they stayed with Israeli friends. And he said that really left an impression on them, on him, like, how can we be uh, friends with people on both sides of this culture? I mean, of this, of this, of this uh, conflict. And his message to students was clear. Obviously, it's relevant uh, to all kinds of uh, cultural and political uh, divides that we face now, um, that crossing boundaries to bridge these divides is, is just extremely important, and we need to humanize uh, those who we don't understand or don't agree with. So uh, these are just a couple of examples of things that my dad stood for and that my mom uh, still stands for and that they taught to us and that I'm really proud of them for. So thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Kerr. At this time, I'd like to, I'm delighted to introduce our featured speaker. Uh, Dr. Judith Tucker uh, holds a PhD in history and Middle Eastern studies from Harvard University and is Professor Emerita of History and former director of the Master of Arts uh, in Arab Studies program at Georgetown University, former editor of the International Journal of Middle East Studies, uh, a top tier journal, and former president of the, Middle, of the Middle East Studies Association. She is the author of many publications on the history of women and gender in the Arab world, including Women in 19th Century Egypt with Cambridge University Press, In the House of the Law, Gender and Islamic Law in Ottoman Syria and Palestine with California University Press, Women, Family, and Gender in Islamic Law with Cambridge University Press, and co-author of Women in the Middle East and North Africa, Restoring Women to History with Indiana University Press. She's the editor of Arab Women, Old Boundaries, New Frontiers with Indiana University Press, and co-editor of A Social History of Women and Gender in the Modern Middle East with Westview Press. In addition, she has authored numerous articles for professional journals and edited volumes. 
And if that wasn't impressive enough, she is a co-editor of the Women and Gender series in Middle East and Islam with Brill, and a former member of the Board of Editors uh, of the American Historical Review. Her research interests in the past have focused on the Arab world in the Ottoman period, women and gender in Middle East history, Islamic law, women and gender, and piracy in the Mediterranean in the 17th and 18th centuries. Currently, she is working on a textbook designed for courses in women's and gender history in the Middle East and North Africa. The title of her lecture this evening is Tracking Women's Works and Lives in the Middle East, a Personal Journey. Journey. We are truly honored and delighted to be hosting Professor Judith Tucker. Please join me in welcoming her. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Professor Mohammed Khalil, um, for hosting me, and also uh, Emine Everand, Professor Emine Everand, for stepping in uh, <laughs> to co-host. Um, I'm also grateful to the Muslim Studies Program, the Michigan State University, for inviting me here. And a big thank you to Mary Fardosi for making the arrangements and being um, such, such a... Um, uh, um, such a great correspondent. It's really an honor for me to give the Malcolm and Ann Kerr uh, Muslim Studies Community Lecture. I did not have the opportunity to know the Kerrs personally. Um, it's a great pleasure, however, for me to meet Professor John Kerr here uh, at MSU. Um, but certainly as a graduate student in Middle East Studies, I read uh, the work of Malcolm Kerr and who was really one of the most astute observers of Arab politics of the modern era, I would say. I was also like many others, deeply impressed by his uh, commitment to the rebuilding of the American University in Cairo, AUB, and of Lebanese society. And I was deeply saddened by his, and, and have a very poignant memory of hearing about his assassination in 1984. So, and actually in advance of the reading, I was telling John that I reread Professor Ann Kerr's Come With Me from Lebanon. And uh, it's a very moving memoir. I'm going to really recommend it. It's simultaneously a family story and also a very sensitive reflection on the society and politics that was the setting for so many of the Kerr family journeys. Um, and so I aspire in a way this evening to follow in her, her footsteps, at least a little bit, by attempting to reflect on my own journey as a historian of women and gender um, in the Middle East over the course of really now some 50 years, when I think about it, and 50 years spent very much between moving between the United States and the Arab world. So how did it all begin? Well, who, who can say for sure? Uh, I'm not sure we ever know where our beginnings are. Unlike many of my uh, colleagues in the field of Middle East studies, I had no particular connection to the region. I had no ethnic connection, no family connection like the Kurds. Um, I, I, um, I did, however, have a childhood fascination with A Thousand and One Nights. And uh, I think it was the most exotic book that was on my parents' stayed suburban bookshelves. Um, and uh, I was probably very attracted to it. So let's start from here, perhaps, this Thousand and One Nights, Alf Layla Walayla. Um, this is the cover from my, the sort of expurgated childhood uh, version. Um, and it's a piece of Western literature, probably best known and probably best, most exoticized um, in the West than any other. And so the night says, I'm sure you know, is a collection of tales. They are adventurous, amusing, wondrous. Uh, they circulated widely over many centuries in the Middle East. Scholars disagree a bit about its origins variously traced to ancient India or Iran or 8th century Baghdad. Um, what we do know, however, is the Knights traveled around a lot in oral and written form, certainly between the 14th and 18th centuries for sure, and it adding and subtracting tales as it went. 
And it's not really a work of history as such, of course, but it's a work of literature, that kind of literature that was very much in touch with social life on, on the ground, um, in touch with the changing in interests and sensibilities of a broad popular audience. So the frame story, as I'm sure you're also well aware, is the same throughout these two brothers, uh, Shah Saman and Shah Rayar, each king in his own country, experience similar misfortunes. Um, while traveling, they discover their wives are back home being secretly unfaithful to them, engaging in sexual or orgies in their absence. So they return to slaughter their wives and their wives' lovers. This actually wasn't in my version, my expurgated <laughs> version, it was sort of elided. Um, but uh, Shahriyar didn't stop there, though, as the story goes, he also, have, after killing all of his slave girls and replacing them with others, he then swore to marry for one night only each night and have his bride killed the next morning because he had to save himself from the wickedness and treachery of women. So after considerable slaughter of innocents, you know what happens. He's diverted by this horrific course of action by the brave and clever Shahrazad, um, the daughter of his vizier who volunteers to marry him and then keeps him spellbound with her storytelling every night. So that morning after morning, he postpones her execution until according to some versions, um, he falls in love with her and makes her his permanent, his permanent wife and only wife. So she is the undisputed heroine of the tale, um, no doubt about it. And she uh, rescues her community from his depravities. And it is her stories that compose the tales and many of them feature women very much like her, intelligent, strong, brave, um, although there are other stories and the frame story itself that also depicts women of a different ilk, um, sly, lustful, and weak. Uh, yet the indisputable hero of the knights is the brave and clever Shahrazad. And she courts death in order to save other women from the grim fate of marrying the Sultan only to be executed the following day. So a woman like Shahrazad a brave woman with a golden tongue who can tell stories that totally cap captivate the listener. I mean, it was really a very powerful role model, I think, for me as a girl, and um, one of the one of the ones that really uh, uh, stuck in my mind over the years. So I can't discount her influences when it came to my later choices. Once in college, I took some courses focused on the region and then decided to make my way to Beirut after graduation. It was kind of a random choice to be, to be honest. And my Middle East story really begins uh, in earnest in Lebanon. And um, the two years, I spent two years there from 1969 to 1971. It was a very immersive experience for me. I studied Arabic at AUB. I taught English in night schools to support myself. Um, I had arrived at a very exciting time. Uh, AUB was a microcosm of local and regional politics. Um, I had thought of myself very much as a political person. I'd been involved with anti-war politics on uh, campus back in the United States. And um, you know, I thought I was fairly sophisticated, but AUB, I just had no idea. I mean, it was, for me, it seemed just very consequential and uh, com both complex and very consequential. AUB had Lebanese students from different parties, from the left, from the right, um, Palestinians from different PLO groups, exiled Syrians and Iraqis, Turks, uh, and so forth. And the campus really boiled with debates, with arguments, with protests. Um, it was a steep learning, learning curve for me. But I gradually began to get better acquainted with the political landscape while at the same time beginning to learn about more about language, culture, and history. And I was increasingly very much drawn to the place. Um, 
the, Be the Beirut years were also, by the way, the time when I realized how ignorant I was about the history of the region in general and the history of Israel-Palestine in particular. And so thanks to Palestinian friends I made and courses I took at AUB, I gradually began to understand the extent of uh, the Palestinian losses, displacements, as well as the claims uh, for justice. And these lessons have stayed with me pretty much throughout my career, I must say. Um, Beirut was in, in that time was also home to a number of Palestinian organizations, especially after Black September in Jordan in 1970, when um, the Palestinian uh, organizations were forced out of Jordan and many Palestinian activists relocated to Lebanon. It was a revolutionary time, actually, when possibilities for building more just and equal societies seemed very real and very immediate. Um, and I think I was especially struck by the inclusion of women and women's issues, at least by some Palestinian groups and leaders. And here is a, a cover, 1970 cover from um, you know, Philistine, the, one of the major organs of the time. And, um, you know, although it's somewhat of a mixed message, you might say, right, a uh, woman is to be, you know, both the super domestic and the, and the gun carrier, um, still coming from the U.S., where women's concerns had not yet gained much traction on the left, I found this kind of surprising and inspiring, even if practice does, did not always rise to the level of uh, women's full and equal participation. So after, after Beirut, the next step for me was graduate school, going back to graduate school. I, I was hesitant. Perhaps it, at the time, I thought perhaps it would be better to directly engage with people in the Middle East by doing something useful like advocacy or solidarity work of some kind. But I suppose my somewhat bookish proclivities won out. And uh, I, re I returned to academia and to a PhD program in Middle East history. Now, fortunately for me, when I went to graduate school in the 1970s, it was a time of upheaval in Middle East studies, um, when the dominant paradigms of Orientalism and modernization theory were coming under attack. And I remember I was one in a group of graduate students who met with Edward Said as he was working out the ideas that would lead to the publication of his uh, I iconic work, Orientalism. And we were so excited to hear, this is before the publication of the book, and we were so excited to hear about his critiques of prior scholarship on the region. And it was truly, we could feel the paradigm shifting. And in place of Orientalism and modernization theory, approaches that had painted the Middle East as a static and backward place where tradition and religion ruled, a place set in opposition to a dynamic modern and secular West, my generation of students was looking at that time more and more to materialist history. And our approach took the form of foregrounding political economy. How had the history of the region been shaped by trade patterns, by the policies of European imperial powers, by the waves of colonization that swept over the region in the 19th and 20th centuries? It was also a time, and this was very important for me, when women's history was finding its feet. It was the era then in the 70s of what we called her story, the writing of women's history as a compensatory practice. So the idea was that half of human history had been disregarded, and the agenda was very much one of finding the women who had been overlooked and integrating them into the historical narrative. So these were the two intellectual trends that informed my graduate days, focus on the history of economic activities on the one hand, and attention to the role women were playing on the other. It might seem a little simplistic. In in the year 2023, um, but it felt very, uh, very new in the 70s. So as someone engaged in the study of women and gender in the Middle East, I think there was an additional uh, imperative at work at the time. Um, one of my ambitions was to join with colleagues 
here and in the Middle East region to push back, to engage the gross generalizations of existing popular views and even some scholarship about women and gender in the region, to refuse the idea of the exceptionalism of the Middle East region and of Islam. And Hoda Asadda, who is a prominent Egyptian historian of women and gender, uh, and one of the founders of the Women in Memory Forum in Cairo, uh, she called upon scholars to, to challenge and refute two types of preconceived ideas. First, one about the absence of Arab women from the public sphere. And second, about their innate help, helplessness and inadequacy vis-a-vis -vis oppressive male authority. Asadda also noted that negative representations of women have drawn support from both inside the region for the purpose of maintaining male privilege and from outside for the purposes of justifying interference. So I think this very, these sort of um, projects very much informed um, my work and certainly when I began to think about my doctoral dissertation. And I conceived my dissertation as focusing on peasant and urban working class women in 19th century Egypt. At the time I started, there was actually no book length study, no monograph uh, of women's history of any kind in the region. So I was, it seems amazing now because now there are, you know, there's a wonderful rich plethora of work. But at the time there really was virtually nothing. So I was a bit, at a bit of a loss as to how to proceed. Um, and somehow I received a research grant, even though my project was really kind of inchoate, I received a research grant to go to Egypt. Now, this, that was in 1976-77. And uh, I struggled, I went headed for the National Archives, and I struggled at first to find materials that contained the kind of information I was looking for. And um, then it was really a chance remark by a fellow graduate student. Uh, he was someone who was doing his dissertation research, but on, on, I, it, on 17th century institutional history of the courts. So he was doing work in the Islamic court records. And he said, you know, uh, and when I was lamenting that I couldn't find women in these government documents, I couldn't find what I was looking for. He said, you know, he said, I, I keep on coming across women in these court records. They seem to be, uh, uh, there seem to be a lot of them. Maybe you should come and have a look. So, okay. So I made my way to the Sharia court. In those days, you know, the Cairo court records were still kind of kept in a back room at the working Islamic court. Now they're in the National Archives, had been moved to the National Archives, but they were just piled in the back room there. And, um, when I, but then I, when I got there, I opened the first volume with the sigil, and my heart sank. Um, because this is what I saw. The minutes of the court proceedings, they were written in a very hurried and loose cursive hand and used abbreviations I did not know. I could make almost nothing out of them. So... <laughs> That's my, the hating cursive slide. Yeah. So I was rescued, and not for the last time, by an elderly man who worked in the archives, who, he, in the courts, really. I, I don't think he had an official position, actually, at the time, but uh, he knew where all the records were, and he knew how to read them, and he uh, basically uh, helped people who came to find documentation from old records. Usually they were about real estate, land um, uh, kinds of things or walk, uh, 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 walk documents. So um, his name was Ahmed Ahin. I called him Ustaz Ahmed and he agreed to help me learn how to read the cases. And his method was to read very slowly out loud as I sat beside him and followed along. And some of my fondest memories of research are of sitting at a table in the midst of these shelves piled high with old court records, with kind of a shaft of bright, dusty Cairo sunlight illuminating the register we were reading, 
listening to Ustaz Ahmed's somewhat tremulous voice and the sound of his beard scratching across the page, his eyesight was really not very good at all. And he had to get so close in order to read the words. So it was quiet and serene in that back room and a striking contrast to the busy streets outside. And once I had a better sense of what I was reading, I realized that my colleague was right. These records were teeming with women who appeared in the court for all kinds of reasons, to buy and sell property, to make religious endowments, to claim inheritance rights, to make and collect loans, to ask for divorce, to demand marital and child support for, from husbands. So in some instances, the court records might be the venue for registering the complex economic ties between spouses. There is no marital community property in Islamic law, so a woman continued to exercise control over whatever property she brought to her marriage, at least in principle. So in this case from uh, the town of Mansura in Egypt in 1830 makes, uh, makes this very clear. I'll maybe give you a moment to, to look at it. Can everybody see it well enough to give it a read? Yeah. Um, So as you can see, this record, it records a debt, actually, a debt that a husband owes his wife. He owes his wife for the balance of these, these by the way, this Nisaf Fidda and the Gurush Rumi, these are different currencies that were in use at the time. Um, so he owes his wife uh, this debt. Part of it's for the balance of her dower. And it was common practice at the time to pay a portion of the dower at the time of the marriage, sort of prompt, a prompt dower, and then reserve a portion for a later date, a, a deferred dower. And the deferred uh, dower was often paid out at a time of divorce or the death of the husband. So he owed her that. And at some point also, he had clearly borrowed some money from her, from Zahra. Um, we don't know why. Uh, uh, but we don't know what we, we don't know what for particularly. And we also don't know why these financial arrangements were registered in court at this particular time, right? Why did these people go to court and and uh, record this record this debt? But we do have many similar cases of the recording of debts typically typically owed by a husband to his wife. And so in this case, I can only sort of speculate. I mean, he's obviously a military man, right? And he's, um, it's a time of a lot of military action. The, you know, Egyptian troops had been deployed to Greece in the 1820s, and they were actually preparing to contest Ottoman rule with an invasion of Syria. So, you know, perhaps Zahra is kind of looking at this and wants to make sure in the event that her husband fails to return from war, that his debts to her had full legal weight and would have priority in the settling of her estate. Because when it came time for probate, the debts, any balance of the dower plus debts owed to a wife had priority uh, payment before the estate was partitioned. Um, so, as I said, the problem with these court cases, we never have the backstory, but we can only kind of guess at what the motivations were. Um, women could also could come forward to ask the court, I discovered to enforce their husband's legal obligations to provide material support, nafaka, and men are supposed to maintain the, the in Islamic law, the costs of the household, um, and to provide, to, to sort of keep the, the wife and the household in the manner to which she is accustomed. Um, and so, this is going to be really hard, is this hard to read? No, you can read it. Okay. I'll give you a moment because it's a little bit long. And have to sort of have a look at it. The French occupation, by the way, of Egypt was from 1798 to 1801. 
So this is the, the sort of historical setting for this particular, this particular case. And this is the, the woman who brings this, by the way, is a woman by the name of Fatma, and she's called uh, El Khatun, which is the respectful title for an upper class woman. So we're dealing with someone who's fairly well off here. So what I'd like to say about this one is that, um, you know, Fatma seemed to know what she was doing, right? So, you know, her husband goes off. He, it's, he, you know, he might have been a Mamluk, but in any case, he he leaves town when the French come in, or at some point he flees from the French forces and leaves uh, her and and um, well. She's sometimes referred to as a wife, but she may have been just she may have been really a concubine behind. Um, and so Fatma seems very knowledgeable because she hurries along to the court just a few days after he goes, she goes to the court and uh, says, my husband left and uh, I need, you know, I, she established her legal claim to marital support at a level that she thought was commensurate with her social standing. And she, what, she's, what she did was she therefore positioned herself to be able to collect payment retroactively once her husband had returned. Um, and as both of these cases, I think, illustrate, both of the cases I showed you, these women were very active and often successful clients of the court. Um, the vast majority of cases that show up, by the way, are property cases, uh, the buying and selling of real estate and walk of endowments in particular. And I think these two sample cases suggest the extent to which these women were quite familiar with the court and with the world of business, and that they could put this familiarity in the service of making sure their entitlements as family members were honored. So as I read more and more of these cases, thanks to Ustaz Ahmed, I was teaching, I was really blown away by the economic and social world that was opening up before me. And I was also super relieved that I'd be able to write a dissertation and uh, and then in due course publish my first book, uh, which was Women in 19th Century Egypt. Um, now I should note that there had been one academic, I don't want to lay claim to, to, to the fact that I was the very first who saw women in the court records. There had been an academic article published on women in the Islamic court records in Anatolia by Ronald Jennings in 1975, a year before I arrived in Cairo. It wasn't widely circulated and I have not read it, um, but, uh, but he was the first, not me. Um, but I had my eureka moment in Cairo and it had a permanent impact on my scholarship. So at the time I worked with this material in a fairly naive fashion, I would say. I was mining it for information on women's activities. And uh, I had very little idea actually about the Islamic legal traditions and culture that informed court practices. So I began to ask myself what lay behind these court scenes. Um, what was the law as the judges understood it? And were the proceedings of the court part of a larger legal milieu? Or as the question took shape in my mind, uh, was there a culture and tradition of Islamic law that was active in the gendering of Muslim communities, in assigning different social roles to men and women, in constructing gendered hierarchies of power, um, and in what seemed like a contradiction in uh, empowering women to act as agents and press, their right, and press their rights in court on their own behalf. So I was again fortunate that I was asking these questions kind of at the right time in, in academia, uh, because the study of Islamic law in the Western Academy was undergoing a sea change in this period. Um, the view of Islamic law put forward by legal scholars of the 1950s and 1960s was one of a hermetically sealed body of jurisprudence that had more or less congealed 
in the ninth, in the late ninth century. So beginning in the late seventies, however, this view was being revised to take legal change into account. A number of studies emerged that tracked shifts in doctrines uh, and practices, drawing on works particularly of jurisprudence, that is the fiqh, and legal opinions uh, issued by muftis, the fatwas. Um, they made a case for doctrinal developments over time that responded to social change, particularly in areas of criminal and property law. And so some of us who studied women and gender began to ask similar questions. Could we trace how the law was developing in theory and practice in reciprocity with society? Or even in response to the needs and representations of ordinary people, female and male, who came to the Islamic courts. So as a result, I branched out from the courts and started to read works of jurisprudence and collections of fatwas in an attempt to understand what informed the court judgments. You know, what, what did a judge know when he sat in a court? The fatwas were particularly fascinating because they shed light on what kinds of issues the members of a given Muslim community might be bringing to the attention of muftis. So the muftis would, uh, would issue fatwas opining on legal questions they received. They could receive them from members of the general public. They could receive them from other jurists. Um, they could even maybe make them up themselves, although they weren't supposed to do that. And these fat fatwas then uh, were often collected, particularly if the mufti was of some stature, and they became points of reference for judges and, and later jurists as well. Now the fatwas are not court cases, they are, they are non-binding legal opinions, but they could carry great weight if issued by a mufti who had a, a high official position or who was held in high esteem uh, by the community. Um, because of his fairness or his erudition. So I also shifted my research in time and space from um, 19th century Egypt to 17th and 18th century Palestine and Syria, and specifically to the Islamic courts of Jerusalem, Nablus, and Damascus. I wanted to study a time that predated some of the um, you know, the, the kind of European imperial expansion into the region. And I also wanted to get some more insight into how the jurists uh, were thinking. And there were collections of fatwas that were produced around the same time as, as, the, as I was looking at the actual court cases. So my research questions came to be focused on gendered law. Um, especially in reference to women's lives in Ottoman Syria and Palestine. And my attention as a result went in the direction of the legal underpinnings of family life. Um, how were the courts and the muftis regulating and adjudicating marriage, divorce, the raising of children and sexuality and reproduction in the family setting? So this was more the subject of my second book uh, in the house of the law. Um, and, and what I found, and indeed what moved me actually at times, was the care that the jurists seemed to take to protect the more vulnerable members of society and to make sure that imbalances of power, particularly between the sexes, did not lead to unjust outcomes. When it came to marriage arrangements, for example, the right of the bride to, be, to receive a dower from the groom was consistently championed by the muftis. And so here is a, typ a typical fatwa. Um, this is from Kharadin Ramla, 17th century uh, mufti. He was an unofficial mufti actually, but he was held in very, very high regard uh, in the community and his, um, his collection of fatwas actually has, was um, used in teaching and used in courts, et cetera. Give you a second to read it. A little complicated business going on here. Yep. 
So what happened here, right? So here's a father who exercised his authority over his daughter. She's in her legal minority. In Islamic legal tradition, a father can arrange a marriage for a minor daughter or son, and legal minority is defined as pre-puberty. As an aside, I, I should say that a marriage was not always consummated at the time of making the contract. This is important to note. Um, generally, the jurists agreed that the bride and groom should be physically ready for sexual relations before a marriage was consummated. Now, in this case, the father allowed his brother to effectively marry his daughter off in exchange for getting a bride for himself. And although amounts of of, of the dower of the mahar were stated in the contract as they had to be for the contracts to be valid. Um, it's clear that no money had changed hands. So um, the dowers apparently were waived in a deal struck between the two families. So the mufti, wrong, wrong, wrong. The bride must receive the full amount of the dower as stated in the marriage contract, and it becomes her private property. Her male relatives, her father or her uncle have no right to bargain with her dower. So in other, and, and we have many opinions like this in which relatives were forbidden to deprive the bride of any part of the dower or to spend it on wedding parties or, or, or whatever. Families might be tempted to make marriage arrangements for family reasons, but the rights of the bride must be respected. Of course, this cuts both ways. I mean, the fact that the muftis have to talk about it means it happens, right? Um, but the fact that they talk, that they kind of rail against it means that they think it shouldn't be happening. So another area that drew the attention of the muftis was child custody and guardianship. In principle, a father or grandfather was the natural guardian of minor children, empowered to manage their property and, and their affairs, as we might expect in a patrilineal society. But what if the grandfather or father was not available? Could a, could a mother play this powerful role? And uh, Hamad al-Amadi, an official mufti in 18th century Damascus, thought that he could. I'll give you a second to look at, to look at this. Uh, question about the appointment of a mother as the guardian. I mean, here, there was no question in Islamic law about the claims of the father's family over his children. I mean, children ultimately belong to and with the father's family, as I said, in this pat patrilineal structure. And once they were past the age when they needed a mother's nurturing. Yet, if the father appointed the mother as the children's guardian before he died, the muftis were clear that no one could push her aside and that she acquired a free hand in the management of her minor children's property, just as if she were their father. So I think it's rather telling I, that that the muftis did not appear to question the capacity of a woman to take on the role of guardian. No doubt women's involvement in a wide range of economic and social activities fostered this belief um, in their competence. Now, I don't want to go overboard and give the wrong impression here. It was a patriarchal society and gender equality was not the goal. Um, still, when a woman protested that her husband had failed to pay her the dower he owed or was not providing for her, or had taken young children out of her custody, the muftis and the judges were usually on her side. So the other major question I had about concerning female agency in the courts of Ottoman Syria and Palestine, um, you know, how often did women come to court? Did they have strategies to claim rights under the law? Did their presence and the questions they raised contribute to the development of the law. In 17th and 18th century Syria and Palestine, just as in 19th century Egypt, women were very present in the court records. I mean, we find them as proprietors of property, as heirs, as brides and wives and divorcees, as mothers. Um, and I'll share one example that really was very striking of the way in which women's presence and predicaments could affect legal practice. 
The official Ottoman courts were Hanafi courts. Uh, that is, they applied the doctrines of the Hanafi school of Sunni law, one of the four legal schools. And under Hanafi law, a woman whose husband went missing was actually in a bit of a pickle. You know, she, um, unless he, she could prove that he had divorced her or he had died, um, she had to wait 99 years or until all his peers had died uh, to be divorced. So faced with women in such an untenable situation, married but with no husbands, the muftis and judges responded creatively. And when a woman came, came to court to claim that her husband was missing and she had no support as a result, the Hanafi judge just would step aside and kind of usher in an assistant uh, Hanbali or Shafi judge um, because those schools did allow marriage, um, for, it did allow a divorce, a woman to divorce a husband if he had been missing for four years. So, and this is how one of, in one of these cases goes. I mean, in, as you can see, it's pretty straightforward. You know, the woman simply, Fatima comes to court and says that her husband's gone. What's interesting, she, her witnesses share her husband's name. So I think she got, um, uh, as her witnesses, she, she brought some of her husband's relatives along, which is a pretty good, pretty good tactic, I think. Um, and having obtained the cooperation of her missing husband's relatives, uh, she, and then she, but the important thing is she swore an oath that her husband was gone and she was without support. And it appeared to be all that was needed. The assistant judge granted her the divorce without delay. And this kind of judicial accommodation speaks directly to the ways in which women, in fact, could raise issues that led directly to innovations in court practice. Because this kind of bringing in a judge from another school to all of a sudden oversee a case, uh, this seems to be really something of an innovation at the time. Um, in a 17th century fatwa, uh, the earlier Mufti I talked about, Kheradin, he dealt with a question about a woman who had her marriage annulled in this way by a Shafi judge, and then she remarried. And then the first husband unexpectedly returned, and he was very upset. And he said, she's still married to me. You know, how could this be? Uh, it's sort of the Martin Gare story, you know, uh, Syrian style. And, and then... Um, so he asked the Hanafi Mufti to rule that, to, to opine that she was still his wife. But Kharadin said, no, a Hanafi judge cannot nullify the ruling of another school. Uh, the judicial divorce was legally sound and binding, even if it did not accord with Hanafi doctrine. So this kind of pinch hitting, bringing in the Shafi or Hanbali judge as needed, then became standard practice and was used in this kind of case. It was also used in some walk of conversion cases. So having done research in these two focused historical settings, the 19th century Egypt and 17th and 18th century Syrian Palestine, I finally felt ready to reflect a bit on law and gender more broadly. And that was, that was this book when I, where I tried to look at the development of the law over the course of many centuries and include the upheavals that came with uh, fundamental changes in the law in the form of modern reforms and codifications. And um, you know, I approached this broad topic as a historian and tried to think about Islamic law, women, and gender as a multi-layered history with three major tiers, as a history of doctrinal development, um, as a history of legal institutions and practices, and as a history of um, the male and female members of Muslim communities who took their cases to court. So... Um, now, there have been big changes in how Islamic law is conceived and practiced in the modern period. And starting in the 19th century, many states limited the jurisdiction of Islamic law to so-called family law. That's not a category used in traditional Islamic law, but it was limited to things like marriage, divorce, child custody, inheritance, whereas other parts of the law, criminal law, business law, property law, personal injury, and so forth, were placed under the jurisdiction of state courts of secular design. 
And in the early to mid uh, 20th centuries, Islamic family law itself underwent a process of codification. So across the Middle East, modern states instituted legal codes of family law, often referred to as codes of personal status. So while they were based substantively on the Islamic legal tradition, the premises and practices of family law changed as a result. Codes limited the flexibility and interpretive powers of courts and judges and court operations came to be more closely associated with state power. So what did these changes mean for women? Well, on the one hand, you could argue that they lost much of the access they had to the court as the courts became more of an extension of state power and less of a familiar community institution. And with codification, of course, the judges and the muftis did not have a free hand anymore in fitting their judgments to the needs of their communities or of the individuals in front of them. On the other hand, we see, we see new forms of female interventions. Um, in 1987, Fatma Mernisi, the late Moroccan feminist, encouraged others to join her in rereading foundational Islamic texts in order to reclaim them in support of women's rights. She asserted that much of the original message of Islam, one of gender democracy, had been modified, distorted, or completely suppressed over time by male scholars and political leaders in line with their own self-serving agendas. And she was soon joined in this project by other women scholars of Islam and Islamic law who offered critiques of male interpreters. Uh, oops, I don't have that, okay. Keisha Ali, for example, argued that classical jurist construction of marriage, divorce, and marital relations in general was deeply embedded in the hierarchical social world in which they lived. And in her reading, the view of marriage as a relationship of male control or ownership over female sexuality owed much to the concept of legal ownership of another person that had sanctioned the practice of slavery. So um, a free woman was not a slave, of course, but her husband's dominion over her body had major implications for her freedom of mobility and her choices in marriage and divorce. So Ali makes the point that the rules of marriage derive from this genealogy and archaic features in, have endured and continue to endure long after the legal framework for slavery was dismantled as inappropriate and even abhorrent in the modern period. So critiques like this have really charted a way, I think, for Muslim feminist scholarship that is arguing for a legal framework for Muslim family relations that accords with the fundamental egalitarian ethics of, of the uh, Islamic message. Um, and some of this new scholarship can be found in a recent publication, um, Justice and Beauty in Muslim Marriage Towards Egalitarian Ethics and Laws, which was uh, sponsored by a, a group called the Musawa Movement. And if you're interested in kind of this kind of trend, they're a very good, they're a very good group to, to watch and follow. Um, so in, in, in addition to taking on the discourse, of course, women and their allies have also taken activist roots to the reform of codified family law. Women's rights activists in Egypt, for example, campaign, campaigned for over a decade and a half for law, what came to be called law number one of the year 2000, which opened the way for women to obtain divorces in court without the consent of their husbands. And, um, you know, they operated on a number of fronts. It was a very uh, systematic and thorough campaign in which they, um, you know, uh, maneuvered between political and religious elites, drew on Islamic discourses and historical records, and recruited pl powerful political leaders to support their cause. So once passed, this law in Egypt gradually gained acceptance, and by now most divorces in the court are um, made under this the, the the cover of this particular law um and and we can we find many other examples of this uh in morocco the revised family code the mudawana owes a lot to women's campaigning women's activist campaigning um as does different um uh, changes in the law reforms in the law that have taken place in palestine jordan lebanon tunisia among others <clears throat> 
Um, so I guess finally, I want to share with you just a few remarks about my personal experience doing research on women and gender in the Middle East. Uh, as a woman myself, and as a woman from the United States. So when I tell people in this country, and these people include my academic colleagues who are in other fields, that I work on women's and gender history and do most of my research in the Middle East, the first question often is something along the lines of, um, how can you get anything done there as a woman? Okay. And then the second question is, are you safe? So, I find myself having to explain that women academics and educated women in general face few obstacles when it comes to their professional lives. In the places where I have spent the most time, and that's Lebanon, Egypt, Palestine, Jordan, and Qatar, women moved very smoothly in professional circles. In the academy, women were professors and deans and even presidents of universities. Now, of course, they had challenges, these were all too familiar ones for women everywhere, probably. There were often glass ceilings. And of course, they had major responsibilities for children and households, just as I did. But they also tended, from what I could see, to have better support systems in the form of family members who lived nearby and were involved in their lives. Now, I can't say that I personally never played the patriarchal card. So I was when I was trying to get permission from the Palestinian Mufti in Jerusalem to do research in the court records there in Nablus, I asked my Palestinian husband to come with me for the interview. And the Mufti addressed him and, and then my husband explained me and my research as I stood quietly by. So I think my husband really enjoyed it since I didn't often stand quietly by. Um, so I can't be sure if I received the permission because I had been vetted by a male or by a Palestinian. Um, there had been some Israeli forces had raided the Islamic courts on several occasions for the purposes of taking Palestinian land documents. So the Mufti was no doubt leery of outsiders and, and their possible agendas. But probably male sponsorship did not hurt my case. As for safety, I, I often try to explain, I, I think I was um, uh, basically very lucky in the sense that most of my stays in the Middle East have not been in at moments of uh, heightened conflict or civil war. So I should preface what I'm gonna say by noting that. But as for safety, I often share how good it felt to be able to walk in urban streets at night and alone without feeling nervous about what was going to happen to me. It was not what I was used to. And my children, when they were young, came along on many research trips and enjoyed a certain freedom, I think, in urban space. I remember one time we were in, we were visiting when we were, I was doing research in Nablus and we were visiting family of my husband's who lived in the old city. And my daughter was about two years old at the time. And I sort of looked around, we were visiting. I looked around, I said, well, where, where's, where's Karma? And they said, oh, she, she went to the shop. Well, the shop was the family store that was like a 10 minute walk, 10 or 15 minute walk away through really busy old city streets. You know, and I I thought, oh, and they said, but she went with Reem. Well, Reem was five years old. <laughs> so, but then I, you know, I sort of thought about it, right? And, um, you know, I realized these two little girls were going to be closely watched by all the shopkeepers along the way, passed from one set of eyes to the next until they reached their destination. It was a similar feeling when my children went to high school in Cairo. After the first week, they were known to every doorman and shopkeeper along the way, and they walked in a way through protected space. Now, I don't want to imply it was always idyllic. Uh, harassment is a fact of life for young women on many city streets. Uh, yeah, so, and there could be other worries too. We spent a year in East Jerusalem during what was thought of as relatively quiet times. 
And my two children were then in elementary grades in a K through 12 Palestinian school. And Israeli patrols would drive slowly by, usually at recess time when the students were outside. And so occasionally one of the older high school kids would give into the provocation and start to yell or throw a stone. And then there would be a chase. There could be a chase, a beating and arrest. And our children would come home wide eyed and frightened, but also full of admiration for these acts of resistance. So I often thought about the stress and fear of parents who send a teenage child off to school under conditions of occupation or of war or of any conflict, never knowing what disaster the day might bring. Now, finally, I'd like to offer a few thoughts about my experience as an outsider, researching and writing women's and gender history in a part of the world to which initially I had no organic connection. Although as you have divined, I did marry in, into a Palestinian family and have Palestinian American children as a result. But I'm an American uh, from a West that colonized and dominated the Middle East region and continues to intervene in ways that cause bloodshed and suffering. A West that has also routinely monopolized and distorted the narrative of Middle East women's history. As a young graduate student, I attended a conference, very much as a listener, on women in development it was held at Wellesley College in 1976. And women from the United States, Europe, Latin America, the Middle East and South, and, and South Asia had been invited to speak. Fatma Mernisi was one of them, actually. It was the first time I saw her. And she inspired and electrified her audience. Um, tensions erupted at that conference, much to the organizers' surprise and chagrin, I'm sure. And the tensions were between what was then known as first world and third world women. Why had first world women been in charge of the topics and the invitations? Why was the Western model of development the only one under serious discussion? Why did the conference neglect to, co to cover the history of Western imperialism so germane to the subject of development? The question of voice, who can speak for and about women from the third world was front and center. So I was alerted early on uh, to some of the sensitivities and complexities of doing research in a context of unequal power relations, past and present. And I cannot claim that I have ever figured out how to overcome these tensions or even arrived at a definitive answer to the question of whether it was appropriate for me to take the scholarly path I did. What I can say, however, is that I have been welcomed, included, and helped by my women colleagues in the region in ways that never cease to amaze me. Uh, in Cairo, it was the women faculty from the Gender and Women's Studies Institute at AUC, the American University in Cairo, and also colleagues active in the Women in Memory Forum. Um, the Women in Memory Forum has pursued a number of projects over the years in Egypt, including the rewriting of folk tales in a feminist vein, uh, constructing a who's who of Egyptian women, building an archive of women's oral histories. In Palestine, I owe so much to colleagues for the, from the Center for Research on Women in Jerusalem and the Institute of Women's Studies at Birzeit University. The Institute is still going strong with a vibrant cast of young scholars who are engaged in research on projects that range from gender equity and Palestinian development projects to approaches to domestic violence. And in Qatar, I connected with a group of Gulf women faculty organized in the women's circle by Dr. Hatun Al-Fasi, uh, a Saudi woman. Women from different universities in Doha came together to meet and share research. That's me and Hatun. So I'm so grateful for the hospitality of these women and their belief in our commonality as women and our shared dedication to advancing scholarship on women and gender. I am not sure I would have been as generous in their place. I can only hope that with their help and through our collaborations, I have made a modest 
contribution as a historian of the region. Thank you so much for taking this trip with me. Thank you so much, Professor Tucker. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, okay. Can you hear, can you hear, let's see. Yes, can, can you all hear me now or no? Can you hear, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Th thank you so, so much, Professor Tucker. That was extremely interesting. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, at this time, uh, I would like to uh, open the floor for questions. We have about 14 minutes. Uh, we have about uh, over 20 people online and we have people uh, in person. Uh, for those of you online, you can uh, type your question in the Q&A. For those in person, um, if you don't mind uh, keeping your questions brief, and Professor Tucker, if you don't mind repeating the question, that would be helpful as well. So why don't we go ahead and open the floor for questions? Okay. Questions, I will, I will repeat them if you ask them. Yes, please. Thank you very much. I found it fascinating. I was wondering, you alluded to, but I didn't hear any description. I was wondering what the actual presence of women in the courts was. Uh, were they represented by male figures? Or were mm -hmm. they actually present and representing themselves? Yeah, okay, that's a, that's a really good question. So the question was, what, what was the presence of women in the courts like? Were they represented by male figures? Or were they actually there themselves? So it's a mix of the two. I And I would say, Often it breaks down along roughly class lines that upper class women are often represented by agents who come to the court and they have to their agency has to be testified to. So it's a very complex uh, system of of, uh, of um, testimony that the agents have been appointed by the woman um, as well, and you need other witnesses to witness the court case. But in any case, that was a practice, particularly of upper class women. However, a lot of other other women uh, were in the courts. I mean, we know it from the minutes of the court records because they say so and so came to the court and they name her and she doesn't have an agent with her. And um, and actually, the judge knows who she is too. Which in uh, so occasionally you need all, she brings someone who witnesses to who she is which I think is a case if she is a completely covered woman. But that's not generally the case. So, you know, you can only, I guess, kind of guess at these things, right? But when the when a lot of women came to court themselves and stood before the judge, and I think the judge could see who they were, and, you know, uh, that's that's the way it worked. But But it's a good question because there was a system to appoint agents that could come to court on behalf of women was generally used by upper class women. Yeah. Yes. Well, first of all, it was a fascinating uh, presentation. I really enjoyed every word of it. Thank you very much. You know, my question is that when you did that research, in my opinion, please correct me if I'm wrong, that was better time for women and if you have to repeat the whole thing starting now, mm. I think you may have more challenges. Let me give the reason why I am saying it. Women in Afghanistan during Zahir Shah, long time ago, had more freedom compared to what they have now under mm. Taliban. Mm. Same thing in Pakistan. They had a lot more freedom after partition and independence compared to what they have now. So is there same trend over there that women don't have real freedom compared to what they used to have in 1970s uh, when, when you were doing the, the starting your research. Yeah. Okay, so the question has to do with the fact that it is, is the research, is, is the climate still the same today or have we seen, um, would it be more difficult for me to do my research today because of developments that have constrained women's mobility, I assume, and uh, power and so forth. I'm not sure that's the case. I mean, I, th I think you know the examples of Afghanistan and Pakistan, and I, 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 I'm not, that's not a place where I've ever done research uh, in any time period. So I can't, I can't speak to that at all. Um, I mean, it's not, in, in the Arab world, it, I mean, I think everybody is having trouble doing research in the Arab world. Uh, and I'm not sure women have any more trouble than anybody else. I mean, it's because of all the conflicts, because of the, the civil wars, 
um, because of a real uh, lockdown on permissions to go to archives, um, it's become much more difficult. I mean, it's, it's kind of a crisis for PhD students today who work on Arab history. I mean, where can you, where can you go? Where, what archives can you, um, can you access? I, it's not my impression it's any worse for women than for men, quite frankly. I mean, obviously what, what's changed visually is dress styles have changed, right? I mean, there was, if you go back, I mean, the, the cover of my book from, uh, the cover of this book, if you can see it, and these are these are these are women in Cairo celebrating in 1956, I think it was, when the Constitution gave women equal rights. So that's what women in Cairo looked like in 56. Now today they wouldn't look like that. Today they would be mostly wearing the hijab. But has that changed how they can move around or how they could can be in the universities? I don't think so. I don't think it has changed. I, I think the uh, the appearance is not the essence here, um, to the very best of my knowledge. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, this is a fascinating uh, uh, discussion, and uh, your views are very, very informative. Uh, I was just wondering overall if the cradle of all these systems of inequality are parents of descent. There are three kinds of these uh, bilateral, uh, matrilateral, matrilineal, and patrilineal. The system you're describing are all patrilineal. Although on surface they may claim to be bilateral, like in the United States. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a bilateral system, but women become men's bearers of names. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was just wondering if the system of patrilineality, matrilineality, and bilaterality, aren't, isn't that the cradle of all this uh, uh, system of just uh, uh, differential power? Yeah. Well, yes, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure you're right about that. The, the question was about patrilineal patrilineality and the extent to which that is really the underpinnings of the system, right? And um, yes, for sure, I think it is. I mean, you know, we don't have many examples of anything else, right, in the world. I mean, we have a few matrilineal societies here and there, um, but not many. So th this seems to be more the norm. And I think your, your observation that in this country, although we don't think of ourselves as patrilineal. We we still are in many ways. We have certainly have a lot of uh, remnants of it. So, um, yeah. I mean, I think it's very uh, you know it's a it's a very good observation. And certainly, Islamic law. I mean, I will be the first to say it's a not just a patrilineal law. It's a it's a patriarchal law. I mean, it's if you really patrilineal, patriarchal. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yes, 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 it is, as is most law that we're familiar with, right? I mean, people always point out the fact that it depends where you look, too. I mean, if you look at property law, okay, so from, from day one, Islamic day one, women had equal property rights, right? So, and equal con rights to, to make a contract. That's kind of huge, right? And it spills over to so many things. When you look at Europe, women didn't have those rights until really very recently, maybe, you know, 150 years ago give or take. So, um, you know, uh, they, they were both patrilineal pat patriarchal systems, but, you know, there are some, there are differences that can be significant, right? Yes, yeah. Thank you for the wonderful presentation, and thank you for sharing your journey. It was mm -hmm. a delight to listen to. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit about divorce cases and mm -hmm. the court records that you ran into because women were limited in terms of uh, the reasons mm -hmm. to seek uh, divorce. And I know it could get quite hairy. And I was wondering if women were manipulating to get the you know results that they were um, hoping for. I, I think a decade ago, I watched the um, sort of documentary, Women uh, uh, Divorce Iranian Style. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. you know. Hearing you at court records, and I'm like, were there cases like that uh, in the past as well? Because I heard you mostly talking about the property uh, related uh, material and marriage, but what about divorce where women had a little bit less uh, opportunity for it? 
you know. Uh, for divorce. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is about divorce and the opportunities women did or did not have for divorce in the past. And um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the basic, the basic fact is that, you know, men could divorce their wives uh, whenever and, and uh, to lock. And it was just a unilateral repudiation and they had the right to do that. I mean, they had certain obligations, uh, financial obligations in the wake of that divorce, but um, they didn't have to go to court. They didn't have to um, have reasons, have grounds. And women did not have a, a symmetrical right. What, what did women have? Women had two ways of getting a divorce. They could do uh, khudla, which is basically almost ransoming yourself out of a marriage. But in, in really in the court records, I saw the husband more or less had to agree to it. I mean, the, the judge rarely seemed to want to impose it without the husband's agreement. He had to agree to the divorce and agree to the payment. And she'd usually give up the balance of her dower and perhaps also claims to, to some child support payments or something like that. Um, and the, but, the, but the third way was, uh, the third type of divorce was this judicial separation. And that's the one where the husband is missing and the woman goes and says he's missing and doesn't support me. Now that one had more flexibility because as I said, they called on other schools of law. They, they sometimes like pushed the envelope a little bit and um, you know, the husband's around, but he's not supporting. So um, maybe she gets a divorce for that reason. He doesn't have to be missing and not supporting. He can be there and not supporting her and she could get a divorce. But she had to go to court. She always had to go to court and she had to make the case and she had to have either agreement or grounds for it. So it was not a, as I said, this is not a, a law, not a system of equality, right? One can't, but there were ways of manipulating the situation. So sometimes men, for example, would take an oath of divorce, like you know, if you don't, you know, if you don't give me my, back my, bring back my cow uh, that you took, I'm going to divorce my wife. Okay. I mean, it was a, it was a, a commonly used kind of threat. So, I mean, he probably didn't mean it, right? But we have cases where you see women going to court in, in such circumstances, you know, and they'll say, well, my husband said that if the cow didn't come back, he was going to divorce me and the cow never came back. So, hey, you know, I'm I'm here for my divorce, right? So sometimes uh, you see that kind of thing happening too. Yeah, so that's a, a form of manipulation, yeah. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Yes. Can I, can I get it? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm like, I was so influenced by the group of MIDI scholars that of that period, uh, you know, because I started grad school in the 80s, mm -hmm. like later 80s. So it's like 10 years after the publication of Orientalism. How do you explain like what happened in that moment? Because it was pre-Orientalism when you and you know Joey Bainan and Zach Lockman and a lot of the people who were involved in Middle East Report were already, I mean, Middle East Report already existed mm -hmm, in, the, mm -hmm. in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. And like, like how do you explain that that kind of, I don't, I don't want to call it revisionist, but that kind of critical approach to Middle Eastern studies emerged in that period. You're part of that. Um, and like what what was the what, I mean, because you don't really have, I mean, you have a few. Arab, you know, uh, like Ibrahim Abulu, and then there's a few other mm -hmm. people working in Arab American studies in the 60s, you know, like Alexa and a few mm -hmm. others. But like, um, how do you explain like your emergence and kind of critical perspective on Middle Eastern studies? And uh, not just thinking about like feminism as part of that as well, but, but really within the field. And you, do you feel like uh, what was happening in media studies uh, and the media studies centers that were kind of developing around that time was in advance of what was happening, say, in African studies or Latin American studies, or was behind, or was kind of the same thing happening in those other areas studies? Okay. Okay, so... Oh, oh, we, uh, heard the question. we heard the question, oh. by the way. Okay. You heard the question? Yes, yes. Okay, good. Everybody yeah. okay. Good. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really, really big and really interesting question. So I think there were a lot of things at work, I would say. Well, first of all, to take the last part of it first, way behind Latin American studies, I would say, no no question about that. And probably maybe on a par with African studies, um, more or less, in ter just in terms of how the timing of these developments. But I think Latin American studies, because I, mainly because they were very much, um, um, you know, uh, the, the venue for the de dependencia 
kind of dependency theory and so forth. So they had that going. And then that, that came to us, like Samir Amin also is a very important person who predated Edward Said when you think about it. And he was very influential. I mean, I can remember being, I was in Paris actually for a year in 1970. So it would have been 73. And uh, Samir Amin came to town to give a talk. And it was, whoa. You know, I mean, this was rock star kind of uh, uh, time for him in France. It was in France. So he was clearly making big waves, right? So um, I would say neo-Marxism, you know, the fact that neo-Marxism was very much, uh, was very influential in scholarship, becoming very influential in scholarship across the board. And obviously it didn't, the, the sort of old paradigms of Middle East, of, studying the Middle East made absolutely no sense um, in a neo-Marxist framework, right? I'm just, we're looking in the wrong, to the wrong places. We're just looking at all this. Um, so I, I think that was important. I think, as you said, Marip, I mean, these groups were important. Marip was very important. The Alternative Middle East Studies Seminar, um, which was a, a group of, uh, people who were unhappy, young, mostly young people. Actually, we boycotted Mesa one year. I try not to point that out too often um, because uh, I can't remember. I, yeah, way before. I know. Way before, way before that. So, um, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I think the intellect, I mean, there were intellectual trends around that Middle East studies didn't fit with. I mean, that that orient, that didn't fit with Orientalism or modernization. Of course, modernization theory was under undergoing huge critique from the Latin Americanists and Africanists. And, and you know, I, I think Middle East studies in that case just followed followed after those fields probably more than didn't really pioneer anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, the big challenge in Middle East studies was how to deal with um, the sort of Islamic essence arguments and the Islam is different and the Middle East is different, exceptional. And, you know, that was really the biggest challenge. And um, I mean, I'm not sure we did it the right way. I mean, basically we just like to throw that all away and focus on, you know, material, material history and we'll be fine, right? Well, I mean, it, it wasn't long-term, no. I mean, long-term, you have to come to terms with culture and society and things like that. Um, I mean, we weren't wrong, but we were very unidimensional, I, I would say, yeah. It was uh, inspiring, yeah. I think for a lot of people. Yeah, like, yeah, I, I, I... yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm very, actually, I'm very kind of, I don't know if it's amused or if surprised or whatever, but as now, because political economy has now been refocused on in a way. And sometimes when I hear people talk about it, it's sort of like it never happened before, you know? Yeah. And I say, oh, well, <laughs> well, you should have been a, should have been around in the 70s, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I'm afraid we, we are out of time. I, I really, really enjoyed this, uh, Professor Tucker. And uh, I, I actually regret now even more that I'm not with you to ask you questions after the lecture. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for an outstanding uh, lecture. And uh, I'd like to ask everyone there who's present in person to please join me in thanking you. Thank you. Well, that concludes our event. And um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah.